Welcome to Zoom O'Clock with your host, Tessie Anthony de Nassau. This podcast brings you enlightening discussions with leading experts and public figures directly to your ears. Hello, everyone, and welcome to episode three of Meeting New Friends Through Tessie's Lens. My name is Tessie Anthony de Nassau, and I'm here today with Frank Flussel. Frank got his master's degree in electric engineering at the Swiss Federal Institute of, Te of Technology, also known as ETH, in Zurich, and is an alumnus of the Entrepreneurial Master Program at the Massachusetts Institute of Technology also known as MIT. At ETH Zurich, he co-founded during his studies time his first venture, ETH Juniors, a student-run junior enterprise. After graduating, he started his next company, an innovative Swiss-based recruiting company, which he exited in 2015. Since then, he has been an active investor and entrepreneur in the field of innovative technologies with a focus on fintech and crypto. It is really such a pleasure to have you here, Frank. Yeah, thank you so much um, for having me. <laughs> uh, so, as not many people know you out there yet, you are very private about your private life and even about your working life. I try today to squeeze out a little bit of you and what you want to share with our listeners. Um, so, Frank... In three minutes, if I were to meet you on the street, what would you tell me? Or if I were to meet you in the elevator, what would you tell me that I should know about you? Well, I think your uh, short abstract was already pretty good. I would tell you I'm an entrepreneur. I love discovering new things. I love building companies. I love uh, discovering new markets. And I just love uh, geeking out and discovering and learning new stuff. Very nice. So, um, as I ask everyone of, and on the podcast, because I always like to know how my friends felt when they met me and uh, where they met me. So, question to you then, where did you meet me and what did you think about me? Well, we met at a fundraiser in London a long time ago. And, uh, well, I guess I was just uh, enchanted about you. <laughs> <laughs> Haha, uh -huh. okay, great. <laughs> um, so, the podcast that uh, the next of the podcast will be split into two parts. So, one is I will ask you some short questions. Your answers can be around a minute long, a little bit longer if you want to. Um, but also, if you have short answers, that's absolutely fine. Um, are you ready for the part one questioning? Sure, fire. Perfect. <laughs> so what would you tell your younger self? My younger self? Well, an advice I would give my younger self, right, would probably be to never stop doing sports on a very regular basis. Because when I was studying at ETH, I was a bike messenger. I did mountain bike races. I was very active. And as soon as I had founded my company, my work days got longer and I just did not have the time. The first thing that went out of the window was sports. And I then tried to get back into it. Um, but the older you get, the harder it is get into a sport routine. And if you just have it, you have it. That's amazing. Also, they say that sport with mental health. Would you agree? Absolutely. If you need a break, you really need to go. Or I, I need to go a bike ride. I need to go run in the woods. I need to do some uh, weight exercises. And, uh, well, it's, it's medically proven, right? It changes your state of mind. It gives you oxytocin, it gives you happiness hormones, so it really brings you into a different spot. Hmm. Really interesting. Yeah, I know for me as well, when I was really ill, uh, I had a really big burnout four years ago. I couldn't walk, couldn't speak, couldn't eat properly. Um, and sports really got me back on track. So obviously uh, to build it up again, because my body was really weak, but it really helped me to, to get my brain back to where it was before. Yeah, and you have to think it this way, right? So we are built to run. Human beings are built runners because we have to run after our food, right? Or collect our food and run around and, and bring it back. 
So basically we are made to move and, and today society makes us sit, sit mm. and think. And thinking is a new thing in, in evolution and sitting as well. So mm. these two things are not healthy for a human being as a whole, as an organism. Mm. No, I agree with you. Um, another question that just came to my mind, well, not a question, really an observation. I think this is the first time you're actually publicly speaking on a podcast <laughs> or anywhere. Is that true? Well, not publicly speaking anywhere, but yes, on a podcast, yes. <laughs> uh, if, you, if you dig deep, en deep enough, there's a couple of speeches of mine. I gave one in uh, Chicago at the Northwestern University. I gave one in uh, St. Gallen, of all places, at HSG. And um, I think my stuff at ETH is not recorded now, so uh, yes. <laughs> well there you go listeners well you know i mean to be honest okay. why is that like that right because in switzerland when i started my company at the age of 25 mm. it was very odd for young people to become entrepreneurs because that was around 99 2000 right so being an entrepreneur at that time everybody said this is very odd you just studied electric engineering why are you throwing away all of that and become an entrepreneur it was not it was not as fancy as it is today and therefore we didn't communicate much right mm. it was not because uh, switzerland loves to push people up, making a big success, and then rip them down and making a big failure so everybody can laugh. So we tried to avoid that. So we didn't have much press for my company, even though we had 600 employees. Uh, we even had for our 10th anniversary, the Fantastic Four giving a private concert for us. Ah, the Fantastischen Vier for the Luxembourgish listeners. And it did not show up in the news or anywhere at all. Hmm. We just kept it private. That's amazing. Why the, why the Fantastic Four? If I may ask. For the <laughs> I love them. <laughs> I grew up with them, right? Uh, Dieter. Dieter, if you're uh, listening, Frank loves you. <laughs> <laughs> no, it was just... That's uh, amazing. And then growing up with them was one thing, but then really meeting them in person was really amazing. It was really uh, one of the craziest things ever. Wow, that's beautiful. So going to over then to that, I think this question is really appropriate. Who inspires you today? Today? Well, I think um, as an entrepreneur, of course, I look into the entrepreneurial um, eco chamber, so to say, and my big hero absolutely is Steve Jobs. I think mm. he's, uh, unfortunately, he died, which is really sad. I mean, <laughs> mm -hmm. because he was the most creative, also stubborn guy I've, I've ever heard of. I mean, of course, I didn't hear of all entrepreneurs, mm -hmm. but, but I think that he really embodied the way of you have a vision of a product and nobody knows it. Nobody knew what an iPod is. That category didn't exist. iPad, the same thing. He invented a category and said, and, and if you do market research and say, ask people, would you like to have an iPad? They say, I don't know what it is. I don't want one. Would you like to have a small computer you carry out? I don't know. So he didn't care about what the public said or what market research said. He just said, that's my vision. I'm going to go through it. Hmm. And he was kicked out of his company. Right? He, he started Apple, brought it up to the first successes, brought it public, and then it got a bit spooky, got kicked out. There were all these really bad managers from Motorola and so coming in, managing it, almost managing it to the ground. He came back, he launched the colored IMAX, he launched the iPhone, he launched, I mean, he was, from then on, Apple was on a rise, and now it's the, I think, the biggest or second largest capitalized company in the world. Hmm. Interesting. Yeah, I think we all have an Apple. Yeah. Um, right. Besides, for Brexit, if you like to become a settled citizen and i need to really make that clear here how frustrating that is you need to buy a samsung unbelievable to register your interest as a resident in the uk did you know that i'm yeah. wondering if the government has a secret pact with but, samsung <laughs> you just need an android it can, yes. it can also be something else yes samsung, but, but still you know i think yeah. it's it's another bit odd oh i i think it fits the whole topic <laughs> quite a bit <laughs> <laughs> when I heard about that, I was like, you got to be fucking beep me. I was like, really? Okay, whatever. Um, so, where did you grow up and where do you love living the most? Saying as well, if you would have the opportunity to live anywhere in the world, where would it be? Well, I grew up in a little town called Wettingen, which is about 20 kilometers away from Zurich. And then for studying, I moved to Zurich, or actually... First, I stayed home in the last year of my studies. I moved to Zurich and I'm still living in this area. Hmm. And uh, to be honest, I love it there. If you live around the area of Zurich, you need about one or two hours to get to skiing. In one or two hours, you can be in Italy, you can be in Austria, Germany, France. You can just be everywhere. It's really the middle of Europe. And um, I love it there. That's beautiful. 
Yeah, I have been several times and I do love it too. <laughs> it's very nice. Um, so going over to the inspiration part again, if you don't mind, who inspired you as a kid? Because, you know, becoming an entrepreneur and, and also engineer and everything you're doing that we're going into more details later, you must have had some inspiration. Where did it come from? Well, so, so let's say this. At, at, um, when I was a kid, I was a pretty big geek. I loved science. I loved technology. I loved electronics. At that time, building my own electronics was, was the main thing. Mm -hmm. So I, was, I had my own laboratory at home. I had built uh, the doorknob of my room. I had put under current. So if my parents wanted to come in, to get an electric shock. <laughs> Gavin and was... Noah are not listening here. <laughs> <laughs> Showed him how it works. Uh, <laughs> I had a speaker downstairs to listen to my parents when they were talking without me. So I had really wired the house at like, you know, whatever was possible at that time. That's amazing. Um, so therefore I was really into technology and I loved science. So Albert Einstein, I thought was a, was a pretty interesting guy. Mm -hmm. I like this idea of, of having a beautiful, simple, I mean, a beautiful idea, an easy to explainable idea that's super complicated to come up with. Mm -hmm. And then I joined Jugendforscht. I did the, um, like a Swiss youth science competition. I got a prize there. And so, um, yeah, that was my, my uh, younger younger years. And then I became an entrepreneur after realizing at ETH Zurich it's only math. And I couldn't, I mean, 24 hours math did not make my, my life happy. Didn't float your boat. No. So I uh, joined a student club and eventually became president. And that led into ETH Juniors and that led into my other companies. Very, very nice. Break. Cut it here, Farah. Just checking if it's recording. Yeah, I think it's fine now. What are we in? I love you. Yeah. Okay, cool. Okay, thank you, Farah. Okay. Oops. So, going over then, um, staying a little bit longer in your childhood. What's your first childhood memory? <laughs> See, it's always good to prepare these questions. <laughs> My first childhood memory. Yeah. Oof. I'm not sure I, I, I can specify that. Probably, well, there must be something well, you're thinking about, no? Well, I'd say one of my fondest childhood memories was... So my grandparents lived two streets away from us. So in the summertime, my cousin who lived in Austria at that time, or still lives in Austria, lived in Vienna, they came over and he used to stay at my grandparents' house. So the fondest memory of when I was a kid was going back and forth with him over these two streets. There was a little, like a little uh, alley that you could ride your bikes in. So we were going back and forth between both houses. And that is one of my fondest memories of oh. childhood. But not my earliest, I, I am not sure I can remember that. <laughs> That's beautiful. So um, going fast forward, I think, into where we are now, what so far do you think is your biggest achievement? My biggest achievement? Can be private, can be work-related. I think my biggest achievement is, is uh, having a daughter. Ah, so tell us a little bit about her. Well, her name is Julia. She's 11 years old. And um, yeah, I think... Uh, I think there is a big, especially in a man's life, there is a big switch from just becoming, a, being a guy to becoming a father. I think it changes, mm -hmm. especially when you have a, when men have girls as their as, as, as daughters, then uh, as kids, then it's, uh, I think, uh, it's life changing. Yeah? It changed my perspective on many things completely. Mm -hmm. Because suddenly you have a very vulnerable person that's depending on you. And other than boys, boys, you know, they're going to eventually beat you as a man. I mean, beat you, not literally, but they're going to be stronger than you. They're going to be faster than you, maybe even smarter than you. So they're going to, they're going to take over you, right? So they don't need your protection that way. But a girl, you suddenly have a different perspective for women. Right? And I think that's uh, yeah, changed mm. my life in a profound way. From the macho to the teddy bear. Yeah. <laughs> As they say. Perfect. Um, so, you know, I'm half Italian and I do have a little bit of a temperament from time to time. <clears throat> So, um, what, or did you ever lose it and why? Did I lose what, my temper? Yes. 
<laughs> like like the craziest in, where in, you were just like in what perspective what where you were like what's happening here like in, in general yeah yes i lost it <laughs> well, I mean, I, i'm not half italian but i guess i have a temper too people would say and um but i think i got better i think if you would talk to my former colleagues at my company they would say oh my god he changed over time a bit he's not so uh stubborn anymore or so crazy anymore But I remember I had once a time when I lost it in a very bad situation. I was uh, going to a client's meeting and I had to specifically met, wanted to meet that one guy. And we showed up. It was early. It was like eight o'clock meeting. I said, I really didn't like that. So we had to kind of squeeze in to, to go there and, and talk about our services. Mm -hmm. So we showed up and then this assistant of this guy came and said, yeah, yeah, yeah you can uh, sit here. Mr. So-and-so is going to come. And I said, no, no, we didn't want to meet Mr. So-and-so. We wanted to meet that guy. And she said, oh, no, he's not here. Oh, wow. And I said, you know what? You're going to leave now. I'm going to make a new meeting. And we're going to meet that guy. Because I'm not going to just wait here and talk to anyone. The most arrogant asshole ever I was. And uh, yeah, we never got that meeting then. We never got that guy as a client. <laughs> <laughs> so that was a bad moment. To well, his loss. His loss. <laughs> um, so I see you wearing a signatory ring. Mm -hmm. As most people in the UK. Yeah. Um, for the ones that can't see the video recording, it's on the little finger uh, for the Americans as well, um, because in America you don't wear a ring like that. So um, can you tell me a little bit about your family history? A little bit, just in a nutshell. Well, in a nutshell, this ring was given by Friedrich dem Großen to Fre the Freiherr von Posen. And the Freiherr von Posen, so the von Poser family is uh, on my father's side, his Grandmother was a von Posa. Hmm. Von Posa und Großnedlitz was a, or still is, an, uh, an Adelsgeschlecht. Hmm. Um, they used to own big lands in Poland. Posen used to become Poland and later. Mm -hmm. And, uh, but we got kicked out. Yeah. So, <laughs> well, uh, well, that's a beautiful story. Thank you. I didn't know that. Thank you so much. Um, This is one of my favorite questions in the whole podcast. I must say, I really like it. If you would have a magic wand, what would you wish for? Honestly, at the moment, I would wish... I mean, I wouldn't, I wouldn't go as far as saying world peace, right? Because I, think, I mean, if I had a magic wand, probably world peace would be the best. But on the way there, I would... Wish... I think Farah said something like that. <laughs> yeah, but honestly, I think we need non-corrupt politicians that play with open cards because what happens right now in the world is uh, devastating not only to environment also to to people to countries to to yeah to everyone right it's disturbing the middle east is is such an explosive situation again because some uh, dude in the white house thought he needed to say we're just going to pull out our troops i mean i don't want to get too political political mm, i can But, see um, it really annoys you huh? no it's a disaster because trump has no idea of politics and the reason why he pulled his troops out of syria is absolutely incomprehensible he has pulled his troops out or he says he has pulled them out mm. i'm not sure if they're gone mm. um did you see today that they are sending i don't know how many troops to saudi now the americans yes they're sending troops to saudi to reinforce the borders against Iran or something like the that. The interesting part is this. Iran, with a couple of weeks ago sending those drones over, showed everybody in the world how vulnerable Saudi is. Because two drones can destroy 30% of the oil production of the world. Right? So the Saudis, uh, they definitely need reinforcement. But the American, they have no contract with Saudis. There is no allegiance or alliance with a country that chops up uh, journalists. Um, and Jen tries to hide it, so I'm not sure how big the American public would react to be in, in cahoots with the Saudis. Hmm. Ooh, okay, well, <laughs> that is question one part done on a very heated uh, topic. <laughs> ah, okay. Um, It's not going to be boring. <laughs> <laughs> that's for sure, with you, for sure. <laughs> Um, so now we're going a little bit more into the leading questions of the podcast, which are a bit about what gets you out of bed in the morning. Um, so I chose for that three little sections. And the first one will be blockchain. Because you obviously are well known in the space of blockchain and crypto. 
um, you work in the space um, and you know a lot about the space. So um, to the listener and to myself, who is very new of blockchain, what is it? Can you tell us in a nutshell, for one that has no clue, first time hearing about it, wants to get in it, what is it? And for what, and what can, what, how can you use blockchain for good? Mm -hmm. Well, well, okay, so I'm, I don't think I'm well known in the blockchain or crypto space. I don't, I don't need to be well known. I don't go to many conferences, but I know a lot about it. Um, but I don't have to urge to publicly speak about it in general on conferences or so. So what is a blockchain? And it's kind of funny because it's in a certain way, it's a big marketing trick, right? A blockchain is a distributed ledger, which means a distributed database, which means a database where the same information are on, on many different locations. That's a blockchain, end of story. Now, why should you and I keep our own little blockchain uh, computer in the basement? The only reason why is because we would get money from transactions that happened on a blockchain. That's why you need cryptocurrencies. That's why when you implement the blockchain, you need some kind of a mechanism that's rewarding people who are willing to keep the technology running. Therefore, crypto and blockchain are basically the same topic, right? The cryptocurrency comes out of a blockchain logic. It's very simple. I mean, blockchain basically is, so think about it this way. Um, you go somewhere and you, you make a transaction. Right. You buy something, you, you, um, you generate information. That information gets then put into a database. Let's say you go to a bank and get money. Right? The, the fact that you got money, <laughs> if you can get money. <laughs> Not like yeah, here in London, um, <laughs> sadly, um, trying to get cash here when all of the cash uh, stations are empty, empty yeah. is quite uh, scary, isn't it? So, yeah, um, well, let's say you get cash from a bank. The bank notes down, okay, Tessie now has a hundred pounds less in her account. Let's say next day that bank goes up in flames. Well, maybe the record is gone. So nobody knows now how much money you have, right? I mean, of course, banks take precautions of that too. But the blockchain logic is as soon as you do that transaction, that information that you know is shared in many places is put to hundreds or thousands of different machines around the world. Hmm. Right? And by being around the world, it's impossible for one government to say, for example, we, we don't want blockchain, uh, Bitcoin anymore, mm -hmm. and shut it down. They can't because it's, it's globally dispersed and therefore very robust. So um, with, if I get it right, because we are trying to implement that with Professor Bodas, mm -hmm. where you're also a trustee, um, that we would use blockchain to kind of record the student certifications, exactly. accredited certifications, which we're hopefully getting soon, um, so that they can use it if needed. The same is also for empowering women in, for example, African countries who have lost their husband, but they have the land registry under their name. Because often in African countries, when a woman loses her husband in some tribes, she becomes that nobody all by herself, is completely outcasted and loses all of her assets Well, her husband's assets, if you want. Um, what do you think about that? Yeah, I mean, one, one important note I have to make to blockchain is it's basically a read, on, a write-only database, right? So you can imagine it in a way, and that's why the certificates are a totally logical application. Mm. It's like a drop of amber. You know amber? No. Nope. Amber is, you can, it's, it's actually, it's, it's, uh, you can buy it as, as jewelry. Mm. And the amber is, is um, I don't even know it in German. Anyway. Amber is a drop, uh, a drop of. Oh, is it second. kupfer? Wait a second, I have to, I have to look at this thing here. Yeah. Well, why, why do you look it up? How about we go to Bernstein. the Bernstein? Ah, okay, so ah yeah. Is a, so, a, more, a very important part of blockchain is it's write only. So it's basically as amber, right? So when you buy amber in German Bernstein, you have, sometimes have these little insects in it, right? Yes, yes, yes. Like and a Jurassic Park movie. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> so basically, and blockchain is amber dropping, amber drops on top of each other. And every time something gets put on the blockchain, it's in there and it cannot be changed anymore. So when you get a certificate, it gets put into that blockchain and then the next cert certificate comes on top of it. And you cannot fiddle around with the underlying 
with any of these certificates anymore. Mm, right? So you have a, so you have one address and you can say, well, this is my address for my certificate and you can find it on the blockchain. That's really interesting. That's really that's actually a really good uh, metaphor to explain yeah, blockchain. Yeah. yeah, in my head it really makes total sense. Clicked. Um, yeah, because everyone talks about it and obviously as I have my own foundation and everything, I would love to implement it, but it's just so incredibly complex. No, it's not. That's, that's so, the fun part. But I think people, I mean, there's companies that make a lot of money by making it look complex. It's mm. not that complex. Okay. So w- which company would you, for our listeners, for example, suggest they should look up for blockchain? See, that's the point, right? I mean, I think at the moment there's so many blockchain projects out there that I have no clue which ones are going to make it, not going to make it, which ones make sense, which mo- which ones don't make sense. Mm. Um, you can, I mean, you can, you can get a lot of information from podcasts, from other sources yeah. to get an idea of what blockchain is and then talk and then they have interviews with people who are in that space. That gives you an idea or just look it up on Wikipedia. Okay. So going over then to something that is, that is using blockchain, crypto. Um, so tell us about cryptocurrencies and why you believe it will change the financial sector. Mm. It's not going to just change the financial sector. It's going to change the world. And why is that? <laughs> dun, dun, dun. <laughs> dun, dun, dun. Well, two th- different things. You can different, <laughs> have different angles of it. Let's take the, the least disruptive one, the, the most logical one. So far, internet did not have money. There's no way of transferring money or having some sort of a, a, a easy transaction with money on the internet, right? You need credit cards. You need fees on credit cards. You have minimum purchasing amounts. Mm-hmm. You can steal these. It's, it's, it's a mess. The connection between internet and money hasn't been there. Crypto is a native currency of the internet. You can have, for example, Facebook makes 70 billion revenue and 40 billion earnings, which means 50% of the top line is more than 50% is just cash. Why is that? That's because the information we put on, we put on Facebook have a value. And what do, what do we get for it? Nada, right? So Facebook takes our information, puts them up and then sells them to whoever wants to sell us stuff and wants to target us and says, oh yes, 35 or 30 to 40 year old women with two kids living in London, these ads they want to see. And suddenly you see this ad, right? That's because Facebook monetizes our data, which means our data has value, which means logically we should get money for that data. Now you can say, well, okay, so now my picture on Saturday night, like, uh, uh, how much is that worth? Well, obviously it's worth something for Facebook. So it might not be worth 10 bucks, but it might be worth a microcent. You can't have a transaction of a microcent with a credit card, mm-hmm. but you can have a transaction of a microcent with, with, for example, Bitcoin, because you can atomize Bitcoin in one millionth of a Bitcoin, right? And suddenly money becomes much more granular and you're going to put value on data. And when you have value on data, then we enter the next phase, which is called IoT, the Internet of Things, because suddenly you have billions of sensors everywhere in the world coming out now with 5G, communicating with each other. And if you have cryptocurrencies in between them, then their data gets monetized, right? So if I want to have the data from my security camera at home, well, my security camera wants to have money for that, which is okay because it's, it's just, it makes sense in that logic, right? So then I pay my camera to get subscription or something. Yeah. yeah. So it's not subscription. It's really pure, very granular amounts of whatever cryptocurrency it is to give value to that data. And with that data, that sensor buys more energy, mm-hmm. right? And so you have a whole circle of logic behind it and suddenly data gets monetized and data is going to be, is already, data is the new gold, right? Data is, uh, is the new oil of the industry of everything, especially with machine learning, uh, weak correlations in data. It's going to be, we already see it a little bit, but we're going to see it in the next couple of years, much, much more. Mm, wow. That's uh, also medicine. scary. Well, also in medicine, that's also good. Well, think about it. Mm-hmm. If you, if you take, DNA tests and you have the, the uh, sickness histories or health histories of a billion people, or let's say 100 million people, you can pretty much predict what a person will have as a sickness next. Because with 100 million people, you have so much data that you find data that correlates with who you are, with who they are. And suddenly you know, well, if your knee hurts today, that's mm-hmm. going to lead into X, Y, Z. And then best case is you get the medicine today already, 
because so machines can, gonna know prevention. tomorrow your knee might hurt. I, it's prediction of, of sicknesses and you can act on sicknesses much faster. You have a symptom, people may say, oh, in five years, that's going to be X, right? Wow, that's really, it's a whole different can of worms, isn't it? Well, it's a different kind of worms, but it's also, it's also, um, it could make life much better mm -hmm. for many people. So, um, in the crypto space, in a nutshell, I know you don't like to talk about your private life too much, nor your work life. You're a very private person. However, when one Googles you on your LinkedIn, for example, one sees that you are the founder, co-founder of CBA Finance. Can you give us just a little glimpse into it and what it does in a nutshell? Well, with CBA Finance, we're trying to bring liquidity to markets, right? Right now, the problem of the crypto space is there is hundreds of exchanges and sometimes these exchanges have different prices. And what we do is we work with our algorithms on mechanisms that equalize these prices. Right? So it's not fair if I have to pay 9,000 bucks for Bitcoin here and 9,200 bucks for Bitcoin there. So basically our systems work on, ex on making these, these both prices the same. Very interesting. Um, so moving on from crypto, because I know you can talk about it forever, but there's another topic you can yes. also talk forever, Longer. which is the last one <laughs> we're going to address, which is podcasts, yes. what we're doing here today. So it's almost like one podcast a day keeps the doctor away, don't you think? Absolutely. So what do you like about podcasts and Why do you think everyone should listen to one a day at least? Okay, let me give let me give an intro. Yes. So, when I was born, or when I was a kid, when I was five, six years old, mm -hmm. um, one thing happened that's very unique for the German-speaking uh, area is um, there is this mystery audio place. They call it the three question marks, the three investigators. In okay. German, die drei Fragezeichen. So I grew up with die drei Fragezeichen. Right. So I listened to them. I thousands of hours, right? It's, it's like hour-long cases where they go after, you know, whatever. Basically bad guys who are um, trying to rob a bank. Not even that. It's really not, not much violence, but they, you know, try to steal mm -hmm. something or something was Yeah, stolen. we know it in Luxembourg Fine. as well. Exactly. Yeah. We have My it. Is, is mm -hmm. cold. So I grew up with that. So I grew up with audio, right? When I was a kid, uh, computers just came in, Commodore 64, Amiga, that was later. Right? So I grew up, my, my earliest childhood was really listening to the Drei Fragezeichen and building Lego. <laughs> so I have, a, I have a fable for audio, right? I'm not afraid of just sitting there and listening to audio and just the voice talking. So when podcasts came up, because the radio is a problem, right? The radio says, well, at three o'clock this, this, this thing is. Well, if you're not there at three o'clock, you missed it. Mm -hmm. So it kind of sucks, right? Mm -hmm. Podcast is like radio on demand. And with today's podcast landscape, you can choose podcasts from the most amazing places and people everywhere in the world at your fingertip for free. Right? So the universe of podcasts I discovered with a guy called Tim Ferriss. Tim Ferriss, I loved his, book, his books before. It was one book called The 4-Hour Workweek. Mm -hmm. And all entrepreneurs I know. <laughs> I read like, it as well. We read it like, oh, it's amazing. Four hours working. How does that work? <laughs> yeah. well, it, Didn't work out that way. No, didn't it didn't. Him. No, exactly. He I didn't do it as well. filled up the last 36 hours with other stuff. <laughs> But we loved this book. And yeah. then he moved on. And right around four or five years ago, he started the podcast. And I stumbled upon it by accident because that podcast player on my Apple phone showed up. So it's like, hmm, what is this? Oh, Tim Ferriss. He talks to someone. Let's do that. Let's listen to that. And it was really interesting because it's a discussion. And his discussions can go from... 30 minutes to three hours mm -hmm. with one person about his, and these are not just random people, right? These are very high performance guys that have are successful entrepreneurs, scientists, crazy people, psychologists, authors, books. And he discusses sometimes their life with them, sometimes a specific topic. And it's just amazing. It's fascinating. And since I'm traveling a lot in all these free time and downtime that I have, instead of just listening to music, I listen to podcasts and just get tons of knowledge in from the from the most bizarre spaces and i can show you some or i can talk about some later stuff. yeah it would be nice if you can stuff talk about I know maybe one <laughs> one or two that would be lovely if you can just share maybe one or two um that would be really really great because i know you listen to 
quite a lot of them. So if you can share just like the two top <laughs> ones for you. Yeah, it's impossible. And I, <laughs> I, have, I have about, I can make it quick. I have about six or seven. Yeah. Shall I do that? Yes. All right. So Give us a glimpse of these. Okay. Please. We always spoke about Tim Ferriss. And he, uh, he brought me really into new topics, right? Intermittent fasting, the keto diet, microdosing, all these topics he talked about. And then what happened with me is I branched out into these topics. So he talks with a guy on that. So he says, so look, where is this guy on other podcasts? Then you listen to the other podcasts. If they're interested, interesting, then you go down there. Mm -hmm. um, so one podcast that's really, for me as an as a engineer, interesting, it's called After On. The guy is called Rob Reed. And his podcast is, um, is really out there. It's quantum physics, astronomy, artificial intelligence, quantum computing, psychology. So think about this. The best episode I think he ever made was with a guy called Avi Loeb who is a Harvard Astronomy Department Chair. And it's about in autumn 17, I think, an interstellar object crossed our... our um, this year, August 17. No, 17. No, it's, it's 2017. Uh, 2017, I'm sorry. So there was, a, was basically a long stick flying by in a trajectory that couldn't be another planet. It flew by the Earth. And people were like, what the heck? And the discussions, unfortunately, it's gone now. But the discussion is, was that an extraterrestrial spacecraft? Yeah. Wow. Right? And, and this kind of stuff. I and so what, what, was, what was in a nutshell, what did they say? You cannot just leave us hanging here. Well, no, it is, it is not proven that it was one. But if you look at the shape or form or how it behaved or how it changed direction, normally if, a, if an asteroid changes direction, it must leave some matter out, right? It gets pushed by the sun. That means something melts on it and, and gives it speed. But this thing just turned in ways that was inexplicable. Right, so the the question is still out, and Avi Loeb, who is a, a very reputable scientist, uh, thinks it might have been a visitor from a former galaxy. Wow. Yeah, yeah. So then I have intriguing. Um, yeah, now it's crazy. Akimbo, Seth Godin. Yes, Seth uh, Godin, it's, of it's course. Good marketing stuff. Um, I can't listen to him too much. He's a bit of a of a religious uh, feeling to his podcast, but he's good. I like him a lot. Then I yeah, his books are really good. What is the book called again? The marketing one uh, that I read. Um, oh, Purple Cows. No. The Herds. No, it's like an orange book. Um, oh, yeah, yeah, the, I don't remember. What is it again? Yeah. I will put it in the link below the podcast because it's 501 for marketing. It's really, really good. It's this is really marketing. Good. This is marketing, exactly. This is his latest book. Seth Golden, yeah. Really good book, this guys. If you work in marketing or have a company where you think you need to put some more marketing in place. That is definitely the book to make you realize that everything is marketing um, and that you should not sell yourself too short. Really good book. I learned a lot from it. Yeah. And then I'm listening to many politics podcasts, which I only want to give a glimpse of, because to me, at the moment, what we're seeing with the constitutional crisis in America and the election coming up next year, just spiked my interest in how does the political system in the U.S. really works? What is behind the surface that we get as headlines every day? Mm. So I listened to the X-Files from David Axelrod. Mm -hmm. David Axelrod was the campaign manager of the Obama campaign. Mm -hmm. um, I listened to Deconstructed. Uh, oh, yeah, that's a good one. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's, it's a bit on the fringes sometimes, but it's very, very good. It's, yeah. uh, it's, very, it's very provocative. Yeah. And then there is Pod Save America, three former Obama helpers. You even have I a T-shirt of that. Pot Save Don't America. you? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> or merch. You need to wear merch. <laughs> <laughs> then um, um, I listened to Politico's Net Nerdcast, Intercepted, Trumpcast, Nerdcast, and I also listened to Stimmenfang. It's from Spiegel uh, aus Deutschland. It's a yeah. German newspaper. Um, but then you realize, in contrast, always how boring German politics is compared to the US. I mean, yeah. boring, but boring in a good way. That's why I don't listen to many Swiss podcasts, because there's not much happening. But that's also very refreshing compared to what craziness we have at the moment in the US. Yeah. Then I listen to Freakonomics Radio, Stephen Dubner. Um, the best episode of his is hard to say, but lately it might have been America's Hidden Diopoly about Democrats and Republicans, how they basically split up politics for themselves. Really good. Uh, Making Sense with Sam Harris. Lately, he had an episode with Ricky Gervais. Oh, yeah. Really yeah. great episode. Shows, um, uh, just a good episode. It's really, it's, it's good fun. Good fun to listen to. Sam can sometimes go some consciousness, philosophy, meditation, the nature of the mind, politics, religion. Um, like all over the garden. Deep, very deep. Oh, very nice. Then I listen to maps. 
MAPS is the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, because we are living in a time where psychedelics are going through a renaissance. We have uh, Johns Hopkins just announced a big funding for their own center. Yeah, that's with Tim Ferriss as well, no? Tim Ferriss is one yeah, of the I saw sponsors that. there, uh, right here. At the, the Imperial UK. College. Imperial yeah. College, we have that. Um, so yeah, I think we, we, and this is interesting to look at because this is one of the trends I discovered at Tim Ferriss' show first, when he had an interview with James Fadiman, and then from there I moved on and I looked into different topics. And I basically, the whole history of psychedelics, which were so LSD was founded by a Swiss person, mm. Albert Hoffmann in Basel, uh, for Ziba Geigy. So he was basically it's a kind of a it's a, it's a Swiss medicine, <laughs> and it was treated as a medicine before that, right? Before yeah. it got crazy in the seventies and got then. Uh, basically put on Schedule 1, which means uh, really... Prohibited. Prohibited and big yeah. prison. prison. Uh, yeah, you can get in the prison when you have it. Uh, but now it comes back. It comes back because it helps against depression. It's, it's comes also, back. I heard about PTSD, severe anxiety, yeah. and stuff like that. Yeah, because I even heard um, that it replaces hundreds of um, psychological... Uh, well, if you sit down with a psychologist, it replaces hundreds of these sessions within one controlled um, LSD session. What it does a bit, it puts down your barriers that you normally have in your mind, right? Mm -hmm. So basically you have much more of a situation where all parts of your brain start to talk to each other yeah. and hidden information might come out and you might be able to process them in a different way than, than when you have your normal... Your normal self telling you that the um, whatever your story is, right? Something mm. that story quiets down, and new information comes out. Mm. And it will be it, it will have a big it yeah. Will have a big, uh, well, I think guys, that is definitely something you should look up. Also with the Imperial College study, which you also can sponsor. They're always looking for sponsors, um, and it is definitely something that will revolutionize the whole medical system forever, specifically in PTSD and depression. So a space to be watched. And I also, under the podcast, will make sure I, I put the website of Imperial and John Hop Hopkins University as well. Yeah. So what else do we have? Maybe one to visit. Um, the Happiness Lab with Dr. Laurie Santos. She gave a class at Yale to say how to become happier. And she thought maybe 20, 30 people would sign up. Thousands did. It's the most visited lecture ever at Yale. Wow. They needed six more spaces to fit the people. Everybody loved that. And it's really how to get happier. Because people, when they get into Yale or into any university, are very happy. As soon as they're there, they get miserable. Hmm. And her podcast, and it's, it's one that's going on now, it's like episode three is out. Now. Oh, I need to check it out. It's I didn't really hear about cool. that. It's really cool. Oh. Because, um, Please share the link for yeah. our listeners. Because I think also how to become happier is a topic that we're having also every day in our everyday life. Um, because, well, the world, when you look at the news and everything, has become a depressing place, hasn't it? It has become a scary place, um, economically, politically, socially as well, with all of these trolls online, the anxiety of social media. There's just so many triggers that make you more vulnerable, I think, as a human being. And I think we, we adults are still a little bit more protected because we have a thick skin from when we were young. But I think my children and your your daughter, for example, I think they will struggle with that, with the pressure that is happening now in society, politics, economics, health, climate. I think all of these things will, yeah, will make you vulnerable and eventually your happiness will go down. So I think it's a big topic to just see how can you clean yourself and, mentally a bit. And, and what she also does, since she's a psychologist, she really looks at it from a perspective of studies and of proven science, right? So, for example, the last episode was, we, we are herd animals, so we shouldn't be alone, right? So when we feel down, we're just alone. It gets worse. But our yeah. intu intuition is like, oh, I'm going to stay home tonight, I don't like it, right? We shouldn't. We should go out and talk to people. Mm. The idea of talking to strangers, they made, they made tests where they had people talking to other people in the subway and they felt happier. By a random interaction with a stranger, just two sentences, something mm. not even meaningful, just a, just a nice yeah. hello, how are you? Even today we had that, huh? There you go. When we were driving to the, to the podcast at the library here in London, which is a private members club, which you should definitely come and check out. 
who's hosting our podcast here, our recordings, um, as I was doing the questions on the tube this morning, um, a random guy next to me said, hey, I saw you writing blockchain down. Well, as it comes, I work in blockchain. And it was a really great encounter. It was a very, yeah, it was very nice. You know, early morning like that, having someone friendly on the tube is quite refreshing, yeah. isn't it? When everyone is grumpy because they need to wake up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, let me, let me tell you two more. Yes. Okay. One is Malcolm Gladwell. What is it, sorry? Malcolm Gladwell. Yes. He's a famous author, Blink. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he has a podcast called Revisionist History. The best episode there is about the song Hallelujah. Oh, yes. And it's... I think I heard about it from the you. Story, it's behind, the story behind the song and how, it, how genius emerged and how, how crazy the story is. That song was almost forgotten. And then it showed up. I mean, you just have to listen to the episode. It's absolutely crazy. Mm -hmm. If you love music and the story of this song and the versions of this song that were until until it reached the status it has today that were, were performed, it's 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 incredible. It's incredible. Wow. The last one I have is Peter Tia. He's a medical doctor and his show is called The Drive. Um, medical topics, fasting, nutrition, sleep, body optimization, and they're the best episode. It's a three it's a three part episode with Matthew Walker. Who just wrote a book about sleep? Mm -hmm. Why we sleep is that the Why book? We sleep, exactly. Yes, I read it. And, Very uh, good. It, and that's see, that's what I like with podcasts, right? So you listen to a podcast that interviews an author of a book. So instead of just jumping and reading the book, I like to listen to a podcast where the author is interviewed. It might give a different spin than in the book. It might just give highlights of the book, and suddenly you know the author, right? Whereas normally you buy a book is like a Matthew Walker. Who the heck is that? Suddenly, you know Matthew, mm. and you know maybe a bit about his personal life, yeah. and you have a much better connection to to what he writes and why he writes about it. Very nice. Well, ooh, there's a lot of podcasts for me to catch up on. Some I know, some authors I know, and I uh, make sure that I put everything below the podcast because I think everyone should go and check these out because they all sound really, really interesting. So, last question because I could talk to with you forever. Um, what is next in Frank Flusser land? <laughs> <laughs> what is next? Well, next is more steps to acquiring wisdom. <laughs> what is next? <laughs> Well, thank you so much, Frank. So this was episode three of Meeting New Friends Through Tessie's Lens with Frank Flusser. Thank you so much, Frank, for your time. Thank you, Tessie, for having me. <laughs> Anytime. Okay, well, guys, tune in for episode four. Uh, wish you a really wonderful rest of the day, wherever you are. And yeah, thank you for listening. Das ist die letzte Frage, das ist mir total erwischt. Total erwischt, mit der Antwort. Thank you for listening to this Sumo Club. We hope this discussion was insightful and has provoked some new ideas for you. Please share and subscribe. If you like to keep in touch with your host, you can find her on Instagram under Tessie underscore from underscore Luxemburg and on Twitter under Tessie underscore DE. <lacht> <lacht>